Thank you, Pastor. This is the first time I've been behind the uh, the pulpit. That's a little bit. Uh... Well, you look good. <laughs> it's a little bit imposing, but uh, good morning, everybody. First of all, on behalf of the Gideons International, I'm just going to give you a little personal testimony this morning, and then a couple of basically a couple of testimonies. Um, I've been with the Gideons for over 30 years, Gideons International. I joined them when we came out here from California. And it's been one of the greatest blessings of my life. And one of those blessings is it brought me here to this church. Uh, I, I've been trying to get a hold of EK and finally got a hold of him and I got a hold of Pastor Thompson and finally we got in. They hadn't, Gideons hadn't been here in a long time. And so we came and we spoke and my wife and I both, we stayed for the fellowship because Thompson wrote, you know, he put us back there. <laughs> he grabbed us, said, you got to go to this. And instantly we felt a bonding with this, with the people here and the church. So I am, I'm grateful to the Gideons. I'm grateful for this church and I'm grateful for my pastor because there's not a better place on Sunday morning in Loudoun County to hear the word of God than right here in Norfolk. And the fact that we've got this going out now on YouTube is tremendous. So we are truly blessed. And a couple of fellows in El Salvador got blessed. San Salvador is the capital. And the Gideons actually do what are called Bible blitzes. And they'll go into a foreign country. We're in 200 countries around the world. And most of them cannot afford to buy the Bibles. And obviously the U.S. supports most of the Gideon ministry. And so the U.S. Gideons do as well. And our Gideons do everything as volunteers. That's the reason business and professional men, it's pretty much understood that you have to have the kind of the finances to be able to do this work. And so they volunteer and this group went down to El Salvador. They were in San Salvador. They were distributing Bibles in schools. Now, most of the places around the world in the 200 countries, the Gideons still get it right. They go right into the schools and they welcome them and they're happy for them to come. We're on the sidewalk in the United States. Now, praise God. We can be on the sidewalk. We're grateful for that opportunity. And we do this down at Loudoun High School and Valley High School. We do that twice a year here. We go on the sidewalk. We could distribute about 100 Bibles. But it's a great op. But there, they're in the, so in this particular school, because of the population, they had split sessions. They had half in the morning, half in the afternoon. And so the Gideons went that morning, and most of the kids took the Spanish New Testaments that they give them. And then they came back in the afternoon and they were somewhat despaired because some of the kids had taken some of these and started pouring the pages out and tearing them out and just throwing them around. And they were kind of rustling around in the wind. But they went in and did their service and of course the kids loved it. For many in these foreign countries, a little New Testament is the only book they'll own for a while. It's amazing. So as they were leaving and going to their next area of distribution, uh, they stopped in a convenience store, and as they were walking up to the store to get in, there was a young man who was blocking their way. They had to go around him, and as, he, as they got to him, he had one page of one of those little New Testaments in his hand, and he lifted it up to these men. He knew the men of the Bible. He said, would you tell me about Jesus that I just read about? And, of course, they did. They stayed with him a couple men stayed, and the rest went in. And when they got inside, the man that was operating the, uh, the cash register, he said, I, I got to know what's going on out there. That's my son. And I've never seen him. He was crying. The guy was crying. He said, I've never seen him cry since he was a baby. He's, a rebel He's in rebellion right now. And they explained what was going on. And they said, would you like to hear about Jesus too? And he said, yeah. Two men, father, son, that day got saved one New Testament, actually one page of a New Testament. And so the Gideons rely on a, on a key verse, Isaiah 45, 11 says, so shall my word be that proceeds forth out of my mouth. It shall not return void. It shall accomplish what I please and prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. So the purpose of the Gideons is really simple. You know it. We want to win people to Christ. We do it basically three ways. We do it through our own personal witnessing. We have goals for that. We, we use our little New Testament that has the plan of salvation in the back, and we try to take people through it, have them read the scriptures and pray. 
But also, the main thing we do is distribute scriptures in the 200 countries. And last year we did 81 million. That's three per second. 200 countries. We have 266,000 Gideons in auxiliary. That's one of the largest organizations in the world. All of them volunteers. Uh, we're placing Bibles in hotels and motels and um, colleges and universities, doctors and dentist offices, um, hotels and motels, I said, and of course, uh, schools where we can get in, prisons and jails. And we do give uh, individual scriptures to police officers. We have a special one for them for fire and rescue, the same, and then for military. About 8% of our scriptures actually go to the military, which is fantastic, around the world, here and around the world, and of course to nurses upon their graduation. Uh, the third way, and an important way for us to remember, <clears throat> is that the third way that we actually are able to carry out the ministry is through the local church, through North Fork Baptist, through our evangelical churches, because we, we have to have the prayer support of the churches, Number two, all of our Gideons and auxiliary, my wife and I, were approved for service. Todd Miller's a Gideon. He was approved by Pastor Thompson. All, they can't be a Gideon unless they're approved by the local church. I don't know any other parachurch organization that really does that. We're linked to the local church. And, of course, thirdly, a lot of the finances to buy these little scriptures, they cost about $1.30 apiece, comes from the local church. And this church has been very generous in supporting the Gideon. So I want to thank all of you here for that. Okay? We're not taking an offering, as Pastor said. Uh, I did put uh, some bulletins back there. These bulletins contain an envelope. If you want to take this envelope home and send us a check, just make it out to the Gideons International. It, we're a nonprofit organization. Your gifts are tax deductible. And all of the gifts, this is the way the Gideons are set up, all the gifts that are given, the gift that was given here today from the church, and if you give any, 100% of that actually goes to the buying of scriptures and getting them out because the overhead, and it's about $6 million, our overhead is covered by our dues. So that's one of the geniuses, really, of, of the Gideon ministry. Another way that we can support the ministry is through these cards. Now, we have a display in the back. We call it the Gideon Card Program. These are greeting cards. They're free. You can use them anytime. This one is in memory. So somebody passes away and you send a card. We're just asking that people will make a minimum donation of $5 because $5 buys one of these. And these go in the hotels and motels, and that's our staple, and then in the hospitals and the nursing homes. These have a potential in a hotel or motel to reach 2,300 people in one year for an investment of $5. That, that's a pretty good investment. Elliot Osowitz was a man who benefited from this program. Elliot found himself in a motel on Christmas Eve prepared to shoot himself, to commit suicide. And quite frankly, he deserved it. Well, I say that, that's not true. But his wife thought he deserved it because she kicked him out of her home. They'd been married for years. She was a grandmother at this time, raising kids with cancer. No support from Elliot. Traveling around the world, doing whatever, living an immoral life. And finally, she came to the point, I cannot have you in my house anymore. She locked the door on Christmas Eve. He ends up in a motel, ready to shoot himself. He looks up on the television just before he's ready to do it. And this Bible, this is not a Gideon Bible. This is a Bible that we purchase in place. It's a Gideon place Bible, Old Testament, New Testament. He looked at it, and his wife was a Christian. And so he took issue with that. So he grabbed it. He threw it down and started kicking it like a football. Don't ask me why. We'd have to ask Elliot. But he tried to kick it underneath the bed. He didn't want to see it. But like a lot of these hotel beds, the frame goes to the floor. Couldn't get it under there. So he picked it up, and as luck would have it, as a divine appointment would have it, he looked at John 14, 27. Jesus says, peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives. Be not Afraid. <laughs> Here we go. Be not afraid. And for whatever reason, he stopped. He put the gun down. 
And for three days, he read through the Bible. On Sunday morning, he knew where his wife was going to be, and he went to church. The invitation, praise God, it was a good, solid Baptist church. The invitation, he went forward, gave his life to Christ. Elliot got gloriously saved because of this. Because it doesn't return void, folks. Amen. It's a double-edged, it cuts to the quick for those that reject it. But those that receive it, it's life. It's eternal life. All because somebody used our Gideon card program, made a donation. Some Gideon, like Todd, placed this in a hotel. And God does the rest. And that's the ministry. And you're a part of it. We have taught that in our Sunday school class. As you give, you are partnering with those that take it out. And ultimately, in glory, we're going to meet, I truly believe, the folks that you contributed and participated in who got saved. Isn't that great? Amen. So thanks again for all your support. God bless you now, and thank you especially. Well, this morning we're continuing with our series on living our lives without fear. And last week we laid a foundation, and this week we're going to start looking at specific fears, uh, and we're going to be doing that for about the next nine weeks. This morning our scripture is found in Psalm 34, verses 1 through 4. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version of the Bible. The psalmist writes, I bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. You know, na national surveys consistently show that the number one fear that people have is some type of fear of the future. Why is it we're so afraid of the future? Well, obviously it's because we don't know what's going to happen in the future. You know, even our best forecasts, they're just educated guesses. Nobody knows what's going to happen in the future. We can send men to the moon, but we don't know and we can't control what's going to happen in the morning. We try to control the future through our worry, but worry is just another name for fear. And of course, worrying doesn't work because it doesn't change anything. What does work? What helps us deal with our fear of the future? Well, the Bible says the answer is knowing some general truths about God and about His promises. Even if we can't know the specifics of our individual futures, there are general truths that God tells us in His Word that are to set us free from living lives of fear. So what does the Bible say about your future and my future that will help me not, have, to not live my life in fear? Let me give you just uh, three things. Three facts about the future that can help take away our fear of the future. First, the Bible tells us God knows everything that's going to happen. Hebrews 4.13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before His eyes. You know, God's not limited by time. To me, this is a very interesting thing. For the last, you know, more than a hundred years, we have known that Time is something that's created. You know, it, it has to do with speed and matter uh, through physics and then through quantum physics. In other words, it's something that's part of creation. And God exists before time. He exists above time. And because God exists before time and above time, the Bible says He sees the end from the beginning and the beginning from the end. Now, the best illustration I know about this is one I probably said to you before. Imagine that Elaine and I go to the Orange Bowl Parade or the Rose Bowl Parade or we go to Macy's Parade in New York, and we're sitting there in the stands. But you got very fortunate. You got to be in the Goodyear blimp above the parade. Now, I can only see what's right there in front of me, you know, and I can look a block or two ahead and a block or two to see what's gone by, you know, but I've got a rather small view. But you're up above it all, 
and you can see, you know, the floats that, that, you know, that have already gone past me. You can see what I'm looking at right now, and you can see at what hasn't even left the starting point yet. And for you, it's all happening as one continuous time. That's the way, that's what the Bible says about God, that God existed at one and the same time in the past, in the present, and the future. It's all just like a parade marching before God. Now, uh, that means God's not surprised by anything. God never says, well, I sure didn't see that coming. God never says, you know, I never expected that to happen. We do, but God doesn't. That's why Psalm 139, 16 can say, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Now, that doesn't mean that you don't have any choices. It doesn't mean that God's written a script out for your life and you have to follow it. What it means is God already knows the choices that you're going to make and the things that you're going to do and what's going to happen to you because he's already been in the future with you. Now, I know that's mind-boggling. <clears throat> we don't really understand that. It's hard for us to grasp that. But you see, God exists outside of time and above time and before time, and he'll exist after time, and he already knows everything that's going to happen. Secondly, the Bible says God has a plan for the future, for my future, for your future, for the world. Most of you that are here this morning know that God, you know, as it says in the dome of the Capitol, one far off divine event toward which all creation moves. You know, someday Jesus is, is going to come again. And someday every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so, you know, what, what the scriptures say is God has not only a plan for everything, he's got a plan for our lives. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. What that mean, it means is God's done a lot of thinking about your future. In fact, God has thought more about your future than you have. And the plan that he's made for your life is a good plan. Doesn't mean you can't deviate from him. You know, we, we, ha we have free will. It's like, uh, you know, getting on an ocean liner going to London. And while you're on that ocean liner, I may be worshiping the Lord and going to chapel services and sharing my faith with other people and reading my Bible. And you may be going from one woman to another, you know, sleeping with one person every night and, and cheating at the gambling tables and, you know, stealing from people when they're not looking. But you know what? I mean, we've got our choices to how we're going to live, but that boat's going to end up in London and we're all going to end up there where God says. So you, you have choices, but God says, I've got plans, a good plan for your life. Now, can you miss it? Well, of course you can. Millions of people go through life and they miss God's plan completely. You can miss it through apathy. You can miss it through arrogance. You can miss it through ignorance. You can miss it through rebellion. There are a lot of people, you know, who, who don't want any part of God's well-thought-out plan that would give them a rewarding like it. In fact, most people say, well, I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to choose my way rather than God's way. I don't care about God's plan. I've got my own plan. So you might miss God's plan, but God does have a plan for your life. And the wonderful thing about God's plan <clears throat> is that at any point, you know, you may miss out on some of the good things that God wanted to do in and through your life. But at any point, you can reach out and take God's hand and, get, and be a part of God's plan once again. It's your choice, you know, whether you ask God to guide you, direct you, and lead you. And because he knew from the beginning to the end, sometimes he knows, you know, they may, they may think they're going their own way, but they're going to eventually come to me, and he's working in and through your life the whole time. He's working in and through all of our lives the whole time. But God has a plan for your future, and that plan is a good plan, where he's going to do something that makes a difference with your life, both in time and in eternity. The third thing the Bible says about your future and my future is God's going to be with me and you every step of the way, if we ask him to, Hebrews 13, 5 says, God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Now, none of us knows what's going to happen in the rest of 2020. I mean, if I had told you, you know, a year ago at this time, what was going to happen up to this point in 2020, you, you would have said, I have never believed that. The whole nation's going to shut down and all the, all the things that are going to happen, you know. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know how the election's going to work out. We don't know any of that. But I can tell you this, regardless of what happens to you 
or to me or in the future as we go into the rest of 2020, we're not going to go into it alone. God says, I was with you in your mother's womb before I before you were ever born. I'm with you right now, and I will be with you in the future. That's called God's faithfulness. God is faithful to us. The Bible says he's faithful to us even when we're not faithful to him. That's why we don't have to be afraid because the God of the universe is right by our side. If you turn to him through Jesus Christ and reach up and take his hand, he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. Psalm 34, 4, our scripture text this morning said, I sought the Lord and he answered me and he delivered me from all my fears. Now the psalmist says the thing that ultimately delivered him from all of his fears was not some therapy. It wasn't some technique that he dealt with anxiety. It wasn't money. It wasn't the fact that he, his political party won or that he had a great education or a good job. He says, it was the Lord. I sought the Lord. I got to know God and he, he delivered me from all my fears. Now, here's the whole sermon in a single sentence. For every fear you have, there is a corresponding attribute of God, something about God's character, something about his personality, something about his nature that can deal with that fear. Your fear comes from the fact that either you don't understand that aspect of God's nature, you, 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 you don't know about it, or you just don't trust it. And if you want to get over your fears, the secret is to seek the Lord, to get to know God, to understand what God is really like. Because once you understand what God is really like, you realize, I don't have any reason that I have to be afraid. Now, if God has an attribute of his character that will deal with every fear that we have, what is the attribute of God that corresponds with and delivers us from our fear of the future? Well, it's God's faithfulness. That's what our hymn was about this morning. Great is thy faithfulness. What does faithfulness mean? It means that God will always do what he says. It means God doesn't lie. It means God will not go back on his promises. God will not be unfaithful to you just because of who he is. (coughs) Because of his character, because of his nature. 2 Timothy 2.13 says, If we are faithless, he will remain faithful, for he cannot disown disown himself. If someone ever asks you, is there anything God can't do? The answer is yes. God can't be unfaithful. God can't lie. It's against his nature to be unfaithful. He keeps all his promises always. He always does what he says he will do. He abides by the truth because he is the truth. Psalm 145, 13 says, The Lord is faithful to all His promises. God will never break His promise. The Bible affirms that again and again. Now, what does that faithfulness have to do with my fear of the future? What is the fact that God never breaks His promises? How can that keep me being afraid of what's going to happen tomorrow? Well, because there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible. Now, I've never counted them. I'm just going by those who who have. And you might say, you know, well, I don't believe there's 7,000. Well, maybe there are only 6,000. Maybe there are only 5,000. Maybe there are only 500. I think there are a lot more than that, though. 7,000 times biblical counters tell us, God says, if you'll just trust me, I will do this or I will do this that. This morning we're going to look at just five of God's promises, five times that God says, if you'll believe believe these five promises, you won't have to worry about the future. What are God's guarantees for my future? Well, first of all, I can depend on God to guide me when I'm confused. Now that's very important because part of our fear of the future is we don't know the best path to take into the future. And we don't know, what am I going to do once I get there? How am I supposed to act? How am I going to cope? Am I going to have the resources to deal with the future? We're filled with questions. And we know there are going to be a lot of decisions. And many of us hate to make decisions because we might make the wrong decision. So a lot of our fear of the future is, is that we're not sure that we can make the right decisions. Life is complex and, and the consequences are so terrible if we make wrong decisions. There are no easy answers. That's why God tells us we can trust him 
to guide us when we're confused. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not unto your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will direct thy paths. How do you know the path into the future that you should take? How do you know the things that you should do? How do you know once you get to the future, you know, how am I going to make the decisions? Well, who's going to be your source of authority? What are you going to look to? I can look to my friends. I can ask them. Some of them are very educated, intelligent people, successful in business, you know. But really, my friends are not that much smarter than I am. They can be wrong just like I can be wrong. I can look at the, you know, popular magazines on the internet, on the television. What do the intellectuals believe? What do the political experts believe? What do the, you know, stars believe, movie stars and rock stars and all of that? But then when I look at their lives, I say, well, why would I want to pay any attention to them? Look what a mess their lives are in. Or I could do what so many people do, you know. It's unbelievable to me how many people are on a psychic hotline or read their horoscope or open a fortune cookie or have my palm read or I could have you maybe or someone that knows about it read the bumps on my head. <laughs> but God says that's just a lot of, uh, you know, that's a lot of who. It's a lot of garbage. It's ridiculous. He says, ask me, Jeremiah 33, 3, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. There's only one 100% reliable for, uh, source about your future, and that's the one and only God of the universe. And the Bible tells us to trust in the Lord and not to lean on our understanding because our own understanding is so limited. You see, what we need so terribly as we go into the future is perspective. I mean, that's what's lacking in a lot of people's lives right now. The reason they're so afraid is because they don't have perspective on what they're going through. Well, God wants to give us perspective. You know, and so how do you get guidance from God? Well, you all know. I mean, we could do a whole series on this. You go to the Bible, God's truth. You pray, you know. And the reason it's so important that you have a time with God every day is because as you read God's Word and as you pray about the everyday things that happen, you learn to hear the still, small voice of God. And so, as you, and so you just know, yeah, what well, God is saying to me in this passage of Scripture, this... You know, and you see how God answers prayer. And so then when the crisis comes, you've learned to listen to the voice of God. And God's promise is, I'm going to guide you when you're confused, when you don't know what to do. Third, the Bible says, uh, second, the Bible says, I can depend on God to assist me when I'm tempted. Now, there are a lot of things that are going to change as you go into the future. But one of the things that's not going to change is, you're going to face a lot of the same old temptations. Now, sometimes... You know, I've heard people say, well, I accepted Christ and that my taste for alcohol was taken away and I never drank again. But my experience has been the majority of people who have struggled with alcohol or with drugs, that that continues to be a temptation in their life, you know, and so they stick with AA, they, they depend on the Lord and, you know, but it's, but it's always a trouble, uh, it's always a struggle, you know, if you've had a problem with temper in your life, then, uh, you know, when you, when, when, Things get stressful and all, you'll have a tendency to, to, to blow up. Or if you have a tendency to be depressed and live on the dark side, you know, you're probably going to struggle with that predisposition until you die. Well, you say, well, what does that have to do with my fear of the future? Well, because deep down inside, you know, one of the reasons we're afraid of the future is because Satan says to us, you've got this under control right now. But the stress is in the future, and as you get older and all, you're not going to be able to keep this under control, you know? And so people are afraid, well, what if I fall back into this? What if I fall back into my pornography habit or my lust, you know, I can't keep my lust under control? Or what if I, you know, I get so anxious, I start taking the prescription drugs the way that I shouldn't, or, or street drugs? Or what if I go back to drinking too much? You know, again, what, I mean, what if this habit gets out of control and destroys me? Well, God says, you don't have to worry about that. Because even though if it's something that we're weak in, sometimes we're going to fall down. God says, you just come to me and I will lift you back up. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation is irresistible. You know, I've had many people come to me in the office and, and counseling and say, you know, I didn't mean to get into this affair, but I just couldn't, 
the situation was such I couldn't do anything else. Well, yes, you could have. Yes, you should, could have. And we tell ourselves that lie sometimes. We tell ourselves, well, I, I can't help this. But the Bible says no temptation is irresistible. You can trust God to keep the temptation be from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. For he has promised this and will do what he says. He will show you how to escape. So one of the ways that Satan torments us, you know, he says, you know, you're going to fall off the wagon. You're going to mess up, you know, and it's going to mess up your marriage. It's going to destroy your reputation, your business. It's going to destroy your health. It's going to destroy your life. Sometimes Christians, you know, they think, well, as we get older, older, we should have less and less temptation. Jesus had temptation right up to right before he went to the cross, the Garden of Gethsemane. That was a temptation when he was praying, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Isn't there another way? You know, he's, he's asking, but he says, not my will, but thy will. It's not a sin to be tempted. The Bible says Jesus was tempted in all points as we are, but he didn't sin. It's not a sin to be tempted. It's a sin to give in to temptation. God says, you don't have to worry that your weaknesses, that, that, that your sins are going to destroy you. Because if you've come to me and you've asked for forgiveness of your sins and my spirit and you're walking with me, you know, day by day I'm going to give, be with you and give you the strength I need as you depend on me. Third, the Bible promises that I can depend on God to support me when I'm overwhelmed. You ever feel overwhelmed by everything that's going on in life right now? I mean, COVID-19 and all the things associated with it, that's caused a lot of people to be overwhelmed. I mean, we already lived in a world where things were changing so amazingly quickly. I remember when I started in the ministry 40 years ago, a high-tech church was one that had a new electric typewriter instead of the old manual kind <laughs> and a mimeograph machine, you know, that you didn't have to ink yourself, but you could put it in the well, and when you turned it on, it didn't throw ink all over you and all over the walls in the church office. Now, you know, you all are old enough to know about a mimeograph machine or a typewriter, but young adults, most of them have never seen a typewriter. They don't know what it is, and they certainly don't know what a mimeograph machine. They're more likely to know about the Gutenberg Press than they are a mimeograph machine. <laughs> and yet, here we are in a church at the end of a road, and yet I get on the every Sunday morning with a group of people, many of whom are over 80 years old, and they're on a Zoom call <laughs> in the church, you know. We do our sermons now on YouTube, you know, and so it, 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 everything, though, is so complicated. It changes so fast. The future is overwhelming with all the things we have to face. And then there are the things that people have always faced, that some of you have already faced. I mean, the cancer, some of you have dealt with cancer, some of you are going to have to deal with cancer, losing loved ones, losing a job, you know, a continual struggle with finances, human relationships, there are going to be wars, natural calamities. What are we going to do? Do you panic? Do you, do you get under the bed and, you know, just pull the covers over your head and, and just hide? It can be overwhelming. Are you going to live the rest of your life in fear? No, you choose to trust in God's faithfulness because God says, when you're overwhelmed, I'm going to support you. Isaiah 43, 2 and 3. When you go through deep waters and great trouble, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned up for I am the Lord your God. God says, I'm faithful. And I'm, always, I'm never going to put more on you than what I put in you to be able to deal with this situation, and I'm going to be right there. Now, this morning, we've read several of them. You know, I think I told you last week in the New Testament alone, there are about 90, don't be afraid, stop being afraid, you know, things. In the whole Bible, there, there are at least 360. Fear not. When you read through the Bible, fear not, stop being afraid. I mean, 365. Fear not, stop being afraid. One for every day of the week. I thought it was kind of ironic because that's how often we need to be reminded we don't have to be afraid. God says, I'm not only going to be with you, I'm going to help you, I'm going to support you, I'm going to guide you, I'm going to strengthen you when you feel overwhelmed. But you see, God doesn't give us all that strength at one time. God's not going to strengthen you for next year because you don't have to face next year right now. You just have to face tomorrow. God says, I give you the strength that you need, the wisdom you need, the resources you need, one day at a time. Jesus said it like this, don't worry about tomorrow. Each day it has enough trouble of its own. The future comes in bite-sized 24-hour chunks. 
And when we get in trouble and are consumed by fear, it's when we're trying to figure out what we're going to do a month from now or six months from now or a year from now. And God says, you just trust me and walk with me, you know, and I will give you everything you need. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things I'll add unto you as you walk with me inch by inch, anything's a cinch with God. The fourth reason I don't have to fear the future is because God says that he's going to defend me. You know, I wasn't really surprised, but I didn't think it'd come this quickly. Pasadena, California, they are now threatening not only churches, but they're, they're saying if you go to a church service, you, are, you can be subject to a one-year imprisonment. One year of imprisonment if you go to a church service. That's what Pasadena, California has now said. And we think, oh my, what am I going to do? How am I going to defend myself in the world that we're going into? But it's not only that, it's not only those kinds of things that we have to worry about defending ourselves against. You know, how am I going to defend myself against the hurtful things other people have said and the hurtful things other people have done? You know, it's so easy to let your life be consumed with the kind of fear that's a kind of hatred that's so defensive that's ready to lash out at anyone and everyone who has hurt you or will hurt you or threatens to hurt you. God says, don't waste your time, your energy, you know, seeking revenge, seeking to get in. God says, let me handle those negative things. Romans 12, 19, never avenge yourself. Leave that to God, for he has said he will repay those who deserve it. I know each and every one of you has been hurt by other people. You may have been victimized by people. You may be offended by things people have done. Maybe you were abused by your parents. Maybe you've been cheated by a business partner. Maybe your best friend stole the woman that you were in love with. And you ask yourself, God, didn't you see that? Of course he did. He sees everything that's happened. The Bible says he even keeps a record of it. And God says, one day I'm going to settle the score. So don't waste your time and your energy and your effort trying to fight everyone and everything and right every wrong. Instead, use your time and your energy to live your life for me in the way my son tells you to live. It's another case of God telling us, don't spend your time living in the rearview mirror. You know, I want to set you free. I'm going to defend you against injustice. I'm going to defend you. Who do you think will do a better job? You can either defend yourself or you can leave that to God. Now, that doesn't mean passive. You go, you vote, you're honest, you express your opinions. But I'm just saying, you don't let your life constantly be consumed, you know, with hatred and anger and getting even with people. God says, let me defend you. The fifth reason I don't have to fear the future is because I can depend on God to reward me when I'm faithful. Do you ever wonder, is it worth it to do all the good things you do? If you ask yourself, why should I continue to work so hard in the future? My family doesn't recognize my sacrifice. Maybe my company doesn't reward my hard work. Well, the Bible tells me to choose to do everything as unto the Lord, that God is going to reward me. You know, I think a lot of people today wonder why I be good. The world doesn't reward it. Other people don't appreciate it. Most everybody else isn't doing it. Why have moral standards? Why be honest in your business? Why be honest at all? Why try to live for God? Hebrews 6.10 says, God is not unfair. He will not forget all that you have done, nor the loving labor which you which you have shown for his sake. Only one life to live and soon it's past. Only what's done for Christ will last. What are you going to do with your future? You know, one of the terrible things about letting your life be consumed by fear is that it keeps you from becoming all that God created you to be. It keeps you, uh, you know, focused negatively. It keeps you tied in knots. Instead, God wants us to trust him and live for him. Now, let me summarize quickly what I've said this morning. God says, in relation to my future, I can count on him to guide me when I'm confused, to assist me when I'm tempted, to support me when I'm overwhelmed, to defend me when I'm, offend when I'm attacked or offended, to reward me when I'm faithful to him. Now, in light of all that, let me ask you one simple question. What do you have to be afraid about? And those are just five of God's, not just 500 or 5,000 promises that are in his word. What it all boils down to is my fears in myself or my faith in God. Who am I going to trust? Will God keep his promises? The Bible says that he will. 
The Apostle Paul said, For I know whom I've believed in and persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I could stand here, Elaine, and many of you, I could call on you and you could stand up and we'd hear testimony after testimony about how God's faithfully brought people through cancer and through financial difficulties and through the death of a loved one, through things that they never thought but that God gave them the strength. Philippians 4.13 says, I have strength for all things in Christ who, who empowers me. I'm ready for anything and equal to anything through him who infuses inner strength in me. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <clears throat> now notice, God never says in any of this that there are not going to be moments when we feel fear or anxiety or panic. That's, uh, that's a, a part of being a human being. You know, the sad thing is, I know as many Christians, and they're going to be in heaven, but who are paralyzed by fear as I know unbelievers. Because all the power that God offers and the strength that He offers and the peace that He offers doesn't come automatically, even if you're a believer. I have to do three things. First, I have to admit that I'm afraid. God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm, I'm scared to death. I'm facing cancer. I'm losing my job. or I've got to deal with COVID-19. I'm scared. James says, you have not because you ask not. God calls us again, you know, ask and it should be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock on the door. We're supposed to go to God, you know, and take these things. Secondly, ask Jesus to give you His power, to infuse you with His power to deal with the things. I Go to God and say, I'm not depending on myself. I'm depending on you. And then step out in faith and do the right thing, taking one step at a time, one day at a time. God's not going to give you the energy or the peace or the resources, or anything else for next month, or next year, or the following year, but He is going to give it to you one day at a time, hour by hour, minute by minute, day by day, as you walk through Him. You will see, as Christians have throughout the ages, that God is sufficient in any and every circumstance. Let's pray. Father, we come to You this morning, and we pray that You would give us the faith to trust you. That when we were afraid, as the psalmist says, when I, will, when I am afraid, I turn to, to him. Father, help us to turn to you. Help us to take our fears to you. We, you know our frame that we are but dust. We all get afraid. But Father, you've told us that you've not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And that's what we have as we seek you, as we walk with you. Father, faith is not foolishness. It's not ignoring reality. It's not failing to do things that we know that we should do. But faith is trusting that you will provide where we cannot provide, that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you will keep all of your promises, Father, and provide for us in every situation as we trust you. Father, I pray that we might not live lives of fear, and in this time of fear in our nation, I pray that you would help us to point people the source of strength that they can count on that will set them free from fear. Fathers, we're set free from fear. Give us the courage to live the lives that you've called us to live through your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.